Happy New Year. Good to see everybody here for the first Sunday of the new year. I uh, got a question for you. How, how many of you would agree with the following statement? It's a general statement. It's not a trick statement. It's not a trick question. Um, it's a simple statement, two words. How many of you would agree with this statement? Design matters. How many of y'all believe that design matters? Okay, good, most of you. Some of you aren't convinced. It's not a hard statement to digest. Certainly a very difficult statement to disagree with, though, because design matters for just about everything in our life. I was thinking about some of the different things that design matters in uh, this week. One of the most obvious to me is um, construction, right? Design matters in construction. We have construction happening here on our campus. Isn't it cool and awesome and amazing to see God moving? Because these buildings are going up. But I was thinking about it. You know, the, the construction process, as cool as that is to watch and see, uh, that all started with design. And the design, I mean, the construction is going to take about a year for us to build these two buildings and do uh, renovation in here and, and all that's going to happen as a part of this. But while that's going to take a year, the design has been going on for over seven years. Do you realize that? We designed it, and we redesigned it, and then we redesigned it again, and then we redesigned it again, and then we redesigned and tweaked other things again. And even now, as the building is going up, we've redesigned some things. Because um, as we've gotten into it, we've, we've seen a need for that. This week, a friend of mine who's also a pastor came into town and I was giving him a tour and showing him the new buildings and showing him the renderings of all the, the stuff that it's going to look like. And he said, man, you guys thought of everything. Like, y'all really designed this well. And his point was design matters. If you, if you think about it, design matters in, in everything that we do. It's a part of our lives, not just for, for buildings, but for everything. Think, think about firearms, something a lot of us are familiar with, guns. Do guns look the same today as they, they did in the 15th century? No, they're completely different. Um, design matters, and design has, has changed, right? I mean, we had smooth barrels and muskets and flint and gunpowder, and you'd have to take the rod and ram the, ram the ball down into the, the barrel and all that nonsense. I mean, that's not a gun we use today. And, but design has changed, and so now we have cartridges and rim fire and center fire, and we have rifled barrels and things like that, all the way up to machine guns, and you know now they're even developing lasers and all sorts of other things to work with guns. But if you went back to the original firearm, which I hate to tell you all this, was invented in China. <laughs> it's a true story. Look it up. It's on the Internet was invented in China, do you, you know how long ago? 10th century. That's a long time ago. But the, the original firearm looks nothing like what we would call a modern day firearm today. Or what about telephones? How many of you have ever used a telephone? The design of telephones has changed a lot. The original design was created in 1849, 27 years uh, before Alexander Graham Bell, by the way, would get a patent for the phone and make it famous and become wealthy off of it. He didn't invent the phone. I don't know if y'all knew that or not. A guy in France actually invented the phone. But the original phone looked something like this. That's what the original phone looked like. Then later the design changed, and you got something like this, a box on the wall. Now, before you got that box on the wall, you had the one with the little hand crank on the side of it, and you had the people on the switchboards that would, you know, direct the calls on where to go. And then, man, the design really changed, and we got the desk phone. Y'all remember the desk phone? How many of y'all ever had one of those? Now, if you had one of those, you were fancy. That was high technology back in the day. You could take your finger and put it in that little hole and go, Remember that? That was so cool. That was, that was like the fancy phones of the day. And then the design changed again, and we got uh, the wireless desk phone. 
looks something like that. I remember when we got one of those at my house. I was, I was a teenager, uh, maybe just becoming a teenager, and it was so cool. You could, you could talk anywhere in the house on it. You could even go on the back porch and sit on the back porch and talk on the phone. It, it was crazy, revolutionary. We, we can't forget the payphone. Anybody ever used a payphone? Pay phones are extinct now. I mean, they're gone. You, you can't find them in the wild anymore. Uh, maybe, maybe, you know, in a museum, a zoo, for pay phones, you can find them. But, but you can't find them out in the wild anymore. But uh, the pay phone is a different kind of design. I remember one time uh, I was in high school, went to Washington, D.C. on an FFA trip. We were going to be there all week. And I remember getting in one of those pay phone booths. You know, the glass box had the little door on it. And I got in there, and I closed the door behind me. It was right on the street. And uh, I called home to Mama Collect. <laughs> yeah, the young people are like, what's he talking about? Payphones collect? I didn't, I didn't have enough change to call home, so I called Collect. My mama had given me permission to do this. Called Collect to let her know we had made it to Washington, and, and we were safe. And then later on, much later on, came the cell phone. Remember the first cell phones? Whoa! They called them the brick phones because they were as big as a brick and weighed as much as a brick. They were heavy like a brick. And, and now we have modern telephones. And they come in a lot of different sizes and colors and designs. And they keep redesigning them, don't they? Every year they design a new one and they come out with a new one. And it'll have a a new charging port because it charges better or faster or something. Really, it's because they want you to go buy a new charger, uh, too. Or, you know, they take the headphone jack off of it, so you can't use your headphone jacks anymore, and you got to go buy a, a different set of headphones or whatever. But they're redesigning them. And, and this isn't just for phones. It's not just for firearms. I mean, think about airplanes. The, the airplanes of today are nothing like airplanes of, of 50, 60, 70 years ago. The fighter jets of today are nothing like the fighter aircraft of World War I or World War II, are they? Or think about the automobiles you drove to church in. They're much different today than they were 50, 75, 80 years ago. Or what about clothing and fashion? Are, are, do our clothes look like the clothes of the 50s or 60s or 70s? Of course not, because they've been redesigned. They've changed. We all use computers they, they don't look the same as they did even six months ago, much less six years ago or 15 or 20 years ago. They've been redesigned. And design matters. We all know design matters, and we all know design is important, and it's a part of everything in our life. And we all know that everything around us is continually being redesigned. And hopefully it's being made better. But here's what I want you to see, and here's what I want you to grasp today, is that God's design is the best design. That's the big idea for today. God's design is the best design. Always has been, and always will be. And because God's design is the best design, and because you are designed by God, there's something different about you and I than all these other things we've mentioned. We don't have to be redesigned. Because God's design is the best design. It doesn't have to be redesigned. It doesn't have to be morphed and changed into something different than the way God designed it. Because it is the best design from the very start. You were created and you were designed for significance from the start, from the very beginning. And so you don't have to go redesign yourself. You don't have to go redesign anything about yourself because you've been created by God from the beginning for significance and designed by him and his design is the best design. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 2 and we're going to read verses 1 through 10 because I want you to hear the context of the first nine verses, but we're really going to spend our time in verse 10 today. I want to read these first nine verses because they're important, and we cover them a lot, and we read them a lot because they're, they're extremely valuable to our faith. They, they give us the context of our redemption, 
and the work of our Redeemer for our salvation. But then there's this incredible point in verse 10 that we're going to see today. Read it with me, Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit, now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts, and we were by nature children under wrath, as the others were also. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in trespasses. You are saved by grace, he says. He also raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens, in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is God's gift. Not from works, so that no one can boast. Now here's verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, and God has prepared those works ahead of time for you and I to do. Four things I want you to see about God's design. Here's the first one. You need to see and understand and believe that God's design is a divine design. It's a divine design. It's not a man-made design. It's not my design. It's not your design. It's not this church's design. It's God's design. Your design is a divine design. Just as you and I didn't design or order the stars in the sky. I mean, how many of you have ever gone out at night, looked up at the stars and gone, whew, I sure did a good job with that. <laughs> Boy, I really put all that just right in the right spot. Look what I did. No, right? But how many of you have gone out on a beautiful night and go, wow, look what God did. How did he design all of that? In the same way, that's our design. I, I love what Job says in Job 9, 7 through 10. He commands the sun not to shine, and he seals off the stars. He alone stretches out the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. He makes the stars, the bear, Orion, Pallades, and the constellations of the southern sky. He does great and unsearchable things, wonders without number, it says. Psalms 147 says this in verses 4 through 5. He counts the number of the stars. He gives names to all of them. Our Lord is great, vast in power. His understanding is infinite. That, my friends, is a grand divine design. And you know what? Your design is exactly like that. Your design is a grand divine design design. The psalmist said this in Psalms 139, 13 and 14. He says, for it was you who created my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will praise you because I have been remarkably and wondrously made. Your works are wondrous, and I know this very well. When you look in the mirror, what are you reminded of? When you look in the mirror, are you reminded that you're getting older? <laughs> when you look in the mirror, are you reminded you probably ought to start that diet you've been talking about doing? Mirrors are great reminders, aren't they? When you look in the mirror, what are you reminded of? You know what you should be reminded of every time you look in the mirror? You should be reminded of God's divine design. You should be reminded and realize and understand the significance of what you're looking at. That the Lord was kind enough to allow his divine design to come together in you. 
that he knits you together in your mother's womb, that you are wondrously made. I love what Genesis says. Genesis gives us a glimpse into how God did this. Genesis 1, 26 through 31 says, and then God said, let us make man in our image. You see, it's a divine design according to our likeness. And then he goes on to say, they will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and all the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. And then God blesses them and he tells them to be fruitful and to multiply and to fill the earth. And then to subdue it, the birds of the sky and the creatures of the sea. God God says, I'm going to give you everything. The seed-bearing plants, the fruit of the field. It's all yours to have. In fact, God tells them to subdue it and to steward it. That's really what the rest of this is about. I want you to subdue it and to steward it. But at the beginning, he says, this is my design. I'm going to make you in my likeness, in my image. And every time we look in the mirror, that's what we should be reminded of. That our design is a divine design. That we are made in the image of our Father. That we're made in the image of God. We're made in the very likeness of God. That it's a divine design. And we see the significance of our divine design design immediately as the Lord puts us in charge of all creation. He says, you're different than everything else. Subdue it and steward it. I'm giving you authority over it. That is a divine design because it's God's design. And God's design is always what? The best design. We see it in our main text for today, Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. We are, you are, I am, his workmanship. The Greek word here comes from the root word poemeia. That that word is what we get our word poem from. See, if you were reading through this in the Greek, that's the idea that would come to your mind here, that you and I are the poem of God. We're the artwork of God. We're, we're the masterpiece of God. That God has made you part of his story, part of his poem, his divine design. God's design is the best design. There's something else we need to see and understand about his design we need to see and we need to understand that it is a diverse design. All divine designs, by the way, are diverse designs. You can look at anything that God has designed and you will see and you will find great diversity in it. I'll prove it to you. Think about the the flowers that will bloom this spring. Do they all look the same? Do they all have the same shape or do they all have the same color? Do they all smell the same? Do they all grow to be the same heights or lengths? Of course not. You can just look at the flowers of the field that will come up this spring and see diversity in the design God has created. When you look at the animals of our world that we live in, do they all look the same? Do they all walk and run the same? Do they all act the same? Of course they don't. They're all different. There's great diversity in the design of God. You can also look at the great diversity in the cultures that make up our planet and our world. The cultures, the colors of the people of God. All designed uniquely by God, His divine design, which brings great diversity to our planet. If you don't think it's a diverse design that God has designed... I want you to consider this. This is useless knowledge. You'll never need this ever in your life, but I'm going to give it to you anyway for free. Did you know that there are over 3,000 different kinds of mosquitoes on our planet? Were y'all aware of this? It's on the internet. Look it up. Over 3,000 different kinds, kinds of mosquitoes. Now, why in the world do we need 3,000 different kinds of mosquitoes? I don't know why we need one kind of mosquito. 
But why would we need 3,000 kinds of mosquitoes? I have no idea. But I do know this. I do know that it's a divine design. And I do know that all divine designs are diverse designs. You see, we need to embrace and we need to remember that as we consider how God has created us for significance. It doesn't mean we're going to all look the same and act the same and do the same things. There's going to be diversity in the design of God because that's how he designs things. When we look around this room or when we look around our community or when we look around our state, certainly when we look around our world, things look different. People look different. How boring and bland would our world be if everybody looked and acted and talked and thought just like you? That would be awful if we were all just like you or if y'all were all just like me. That, that would be the, the most weird, strange, awful world ever to live in if we were all the exact same. We should thank the Lord for the diversity he has woven into and the diversity he has embedded into and the diversity he has implanted into his design. Paul put it like this, talking about diversity within the church. He says this, it's kind of a long passage in 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 27, but it's worth our time to read it. He says, for just as the body is one and has many parts, and all the parts of that body, though many, are one body, so also is Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free. And we were all given one spirit to drink. Indeed, verse 14, the body is not one part, but many. So he starts with this idea that we're all one and we're all part of this body. But he says, but guess what? We're not all the same. We're not all the same part. And then in verse 15, he says, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body. It's not for that reason any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, it is not for that reason any less a part of the body. And if the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? And if the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, verse 18, God has arranged each one of the parts in the body just as he wanted. And if they were all the same part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. Or again, the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that are weaker are indispensable. And those parts of the body that are considered less honorable, we clothe these with greater honor. And our unrespectable parts are treated with great respect, which our respectable parts do not need. Instead, God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the less honorable, so that there would be no division in the body, but that the members would have the same concern for each other. So if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and individual members of it. He's saying we're not all the same. But we're all a part of the same thing God has designed. If we had more time today, we could look at many other passages in Scripture that deal with the same idea. Passages dealing with spiritual gifts that God doesn't give us or grant us all the same gifts. Amen? We have different gifts, and he bestows those gifts onto different people for his glory and for the glory of his church and for the glory of the gospel. And that great diversity that the Lord gives to us is part of his grand design. You and I were created for significance, and we can see that in our divine, diverse design. And we must never, ever, ever, church, forget that God's design is the best design. Now, here's the thing, though, with diversity. Sometimes great diversity in a divine design will get on our nerves, and it'll bother us. And it'll irritate us. It's kind of like, why are there over 3,000 mosquitoes in the world? We don't need those suckers flying around, sucking the blood out of us. But we have to remember, it's God's design. His divine, diverse design. And God's design, whether we believe it or not, is the best design. Number three, it's also a dependent 
design. In other words, it's not a design that we can sustain or maintain under our own power. His design is divine, and his design is diverse, but his design also makes us dependent on him. That's part of the design. If you look at Ephesians 2.10, it says, for we are his workmanship. We're not our own workmanship, we're his. And then it says, we are created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. Three times in this one verse, he reminds us and emphasizes for us our dependence on him. We are his workmanship, we're created in Christ Jesus, and that God himself prepared ahead of time the works we're supposed to do. He's created you for significance by design. Yes, it's a divine design and a diverse design, but it's also a dependent design. Without him, it doesn't work. Jesus said this in John 15, verses 1 through 8, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. Every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he removes, and he prunes every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me, he says in verse 4, and I in you, just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches, and the one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown aside like a branch and he withers. They gather them, they throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. You see, your significance and mine is tied to the vine. When we get off the vine, that's when we get in trouble, amen? When we get off and away from the vine... That's when we lose sight of who we are. That's when we lose sight of what God's purpose for our life is. That's when we lose sight of our significance and God's plan and God's power. And that's when we get into trouble. So we got to stay on the vine. This divine design requires you to be on the vine. It requires you to remain in a posture of dependence on God, total dependence on the Lord. The Lord designed you and I to live in a relationship with him. He's designed us to be connected to him and dependent on him for the power of life. Just this week, I was talking to a friend overseas in a country right now that is being riddled by war, warfare, His job has gone away because of this war. So he's been without a job now for uh, going on four months, basically. And and I just asked him how he was getting along, and he said, it's been pretty tough. And I said, well, hey, does the government, like, are they helping y'all with anything? Like, are you getting a stimulus check in the mail? Are they giving you food stamps? He said, no, they don't give us nothing. And you know, I I kind of was expecting him to say, hey, could you help me out? Or, hey, do you think your church could make a donation to me to help me get by? But you know what he said? Because I said, oh man, that's got to be tough. It's got to be really tough on you and your family and your kids and your wife. Man, I, gosh. You know what he said? He didn't didn't ask for anything. He said, you know, he said, no, it, it, it really hasn't been that bad. He said, you know what it is? He said, it's a great opportunity for us to see God move. He said, we haven't wanted for anything. We haven't needed anything. God has provided for everything we've needed in this time. And day after day and week after week, we continue to see the power of God in our life. Wouldn't you love to see God's power like that in your life? You got to be on the vine. You see, this tragedy, this hardship in his life 
has put him in a position where he's got to be on the vine. And because of that, he sees God's power moving in incredible ways. See, God created you and I to be on the vine in relationship with him. It's his design that we be dependent on him. And God's design is the best design. And I know what some of y'all are thinking. You're thinking, man, that's really simple. That's really basic. You're right. It is. (laughs) It's really simple. This isn't rocket science at all. But here would be my question. If it's so simple, why don't you do it? If it's so easy, why not give it a try? Why not get back to it? Live your life in total dependence on God and see what happens in the days ahead. See what happens in the months ahead. See what happens in the years ahead when you get back on the vine and live in dependence for everything from him. God's design is the best design, and he has designed you and I to live in dependence on him. Last one is this, number four. It's also your design, my design, this incredible design is a dynamic design. God's design is not a stagnant design, It's not a lifeless design. It's not a dead design. It's not a dormant design. It's not an old, musty, stale design. That's what people would have you believe. Oh, that's an old design. That doesn't work anymore. No, 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 no. It is a dynamic design. We see a small part of it in our text for today. Read it again in Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship, and here it is, We have been created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. He has prepared ahead of time for you and I good works that we are to do. There's a dynamic nature to the design of God. God's design is dynamic in part because of the great diversity that's in his design. It's naturally, kind of by default, going to be dynamic because of the diversity that is inside of the design. But it's also dynamic because he has given you and I a part in the design. He's created you and me in Christ Jesus for good works. And those things are going to naturally make everything very dynamic because some of us will do the works and some of us will not. Some of us will go do works that he never called us to do because we got off the vine. And that's going to make things dynamic and change things in the design. And and we have to be very careful here, church, when it comes to talking about works. And we've got to be very clear when it comes to talking about works. People listen to this broadcast across the world really now, thanks to social media and the radio program and other things. So we've got to be very, very careful here because many, many people will get confused when it comes to works. Many people are led astray by and because of false unbiblical teaching regarding works. There's, there's really one key thing you have to always remember when it comes to works and what the Bible says about works. I read one commentator's take on this some years ago. These aren't aren't my words, but it was so simple and it was so right on, I never forgot it. He summed it up like this. He said, no good works can produce salvation, but many good works are produced by salvation. In other words, your works can never, ever, ever save you. Your works will never save you. Your works have no power to save you. But your salvation, your redemption, your repentance, your belief in Jesus will inevitably change you and prompt you to be an obedient disciple and do the works that you were designed to do. The works you were created to do, the works God planned, Paul says, beforehand for you to do. Barclay, another commentator, he said it this way, all the good works in the world cannot put us right with God, but there is something radically wrong with Christianity that does not result in good works. 
You see, there's a, a great danger and even an evil deceit in those who place too much power and authority and value on their works and who teach that, that, that works have a place in the redemptive activity of a sinner's soul, that, that works in any way, shape, or form have anything to do with our salvation. There, there's deceit there and evil there. But there's also a great danger on the other end of the spectrum, and, and, and this is something that has grown up in the Western church and the American church, and something that is preached more often than you might think in Christian churches across the land, and that's people who swing so far to the other side of the issue that, that they claim that our works are totally useless. And they will teach, and they will preach, and they will proclaim that there's no command in all of Scripture for a disciple to do any work at all. That we can just be lazy and let God do all the work. But they're out of step with Scripture as well. I don't have time today to go through all the Scripture, but let me give you three from Paul. 2 Corinthians 9, 8. Paul said this, And God is able to make every grace overflow to you, so that in every way, always having everything you need, you may excel in what? Every good what? Work. I think he's expecting Christians and believers to be working. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good what? Work. The word of God is supposed to transform us so we do the work of God. Titus chapter 2 verse 14 he gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to cleanse for himself a people of his own possession the redemptive activity of God is through Jesus and Jesus alone but that results in a people a church a body who is eager to do what good works James the brother of Jesus he doesn't pull any punches in James chapter 2 he says it just like this. In the same way, faith, if it does not have works, is dead by itself. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works and I will show you faith by my works. You believe that God is one? Good, even the demons believe that and shudder. Senseless person, he calls them. Are you willing to learn that faith without works is useless? And if you don't believe this testimony, listen to the testimony of Jesus in John 15, 8. My Father is glorified by this, that you produce much fruit. That's going to be impossible without work. And you prove to be my disciples, again, impossible without being obedient to do the work he's created for you to do. Or you can jump all the way to the end of the book, Revelation 22, verse 12. And again, we hear the words of Christ who says this, look, I'm coming soon, and my reward is with me to repay each person according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. So the idea and the concept of us working and doing good works is not foreign in Scripture. No, it's a very familiar idea in Scripture. So if we obey our Father and do the works He has designed for us to do and created us to do, guess what happens? It creates this extremely dynamic world, an extremely dynamic church. It puts us in extremely dynamic situations to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. Another commentator said it like this, before we can do any good work for the Lord... He has to do his good work in us. Boy, isn't he right. We can't do any good work for God until God has done his good work inside of us. Until our hearts have been cleansed, our sins have been forgiven. Until we have repented and called on Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Because our good works aren't going to clean us up. Our good works aren't going to make us holy. Our good works aren't going to make us whole. Our good works aren't going to save us. Jesus has to do that. 
And if God's good and gracious and glorious work of salvation has not been done inside of your heart, boy, I pray today would be the day. I pray today would be the day that you call on Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I pray that today would be the day that you repent of your sins. The only work that can save you is the work of the cross, the work of the blood of the Lamb of God, the work of Calvary. Call on him this hour. Call on him this day. Call on him and be saved, be made new, be made clean. And then join this incredible plan God has designed and do the works he's called you to do. Let's pray. If you can hear my voice today and have never called on Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, we invite you to do that. Not by walking an aisle, but by doing your business with God. Right there where you are, you don't have to say anything out loud, you don't have to pray out loud. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. But if you need to repent of your sins and let God do his work in you, start with this. Say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed things up and gone astray, so Lord, I ask now by faith that you would change me from the inside out. Lord, I ask by faith that you would make me new, that you would make me whole. I ask by faith that you would forgive me, cleanse me, Do your work in me. I thank you for your grace and for your goodness, for your love and for your mercy, and for the incredible way you have designed me for your glory. Lord, as we close this hour, we are so grateful. Grateful for this divine, diverse, dynamic, design that you have woven us and embedded us into Lord that you have made us a part of I pray that we would live as your disciples and do your will and do your work in the days ahead Father that you would be honored by what we do with our hands and our feet and Lord by the way we live our lives Thank you for giving us another year to do it and another opportunity to be a part of what you've created. Lord, we love you. We thank you. And Lord, I thank you for all who've gathered here to worship you today. May you remind them every time they look in the mirror of the divine design you have put in them and the great purpose they have been created for. We ask this, we pray this, we believe this now in Jesus' name.